excites me. Amen. That's what we're going to talk about a little bit tonight. As we continue on to Revelation, Revelation chapter 3, we finish out the chapter tonight. And really, we're going to finish out the first portion of the book of Revelation. We're talking about the things which are. And next week, we'll be on to the things hereafter. And that's what, to me, really gets exciting because we as Christians get insight that the world don't, doesn't have about what the future holds. Revelation chapter 3, if you're willing able to stand. Revelation chapter 3, verse 14. It says, And unto the angel of the church of Laodicea seems right. These things saith, Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither hot nor cold, I would that thou were cold or hot. So then because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest that I am rich and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable, and poor and blind and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with thy self, that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him, and I will sup with him, and he with me. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame, and am set down with my Father in his throne. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, we just praise you for the Lord today, God.
Apostle John was writing these words down. He was looking into the future. And now we can look back some 2,000 years later and we can see the events that's taking place. He got them all right. So now that we're here in the present day, here in Laodicea, we know that he's still right. And so this is the church age in which we're living today. And as we go through this, you'll be able to look and say, man, that is right exactly where we're at. Um, let me say that there is not one word of commendation to this church of the Lord. Not one word. He didn't say one good thing about this church. Not one. It was all of condemnation. And now the other churches, even though they had a lot of condemning messages, he had something good to say about every one of us at this point. Then I'll tell you where we're at today. There are no greater words of disgust and contempt in the Bible than what the Lord says about the last seen church. Uh, I mean, it literally makes him sick. And that's what we're preaching on tonight, is the church that makes God sick. Um, that now, when we read about Laodicea, there's really two things that we need to take away from this message. We need to take part. Um, and this is all by way of introduction. This isn't actually the message yet, but there's some things we need to take away from this. And that the first thing is, is look, just because we live in the Laodicean church age, does not mean that we have to have a Laodicean church. Amen. We can have a church that's on fire, even in the midst of all this apostasy and all this corruption and all this backsliding and all this complacency. We can be that burning bush in the desert. Amen. You know, Moses, he passed by hundreds and thousands of bushes in the desert, but he stopped at the one that was on fire. That ought to be a lesson to us. And so we don't have to have a loud seen church just because we live in that area. I, I mean, I've I heard preachers preach out of this text, and it almost sounds like it's a lost cause. Well, we're, we're just living in that age, and so, you know, it's just going to happen. I mean, the Bible said it's going to happen, yeah, but it don't have to happen here. Amen. Amen. So we need to have a good church even in a loud seen area. So that's the practical application. But there's also a personal application here. A church is made up of individuals. They have to individually choose for themselves to be on fire for God, to serve and live for God. And so on a personal level, we need to take this to heart. When, when I preach about a church that makes God sick, I'm going to tell you, there's a lot of Christians that make God sick. Ch hey, look, churches that make God sick are full of people that make God sick. And I don't know of any other way to say it, but look, there's really no G-rated version of this message. I mean, the Lord's upset. And uh, you won't find Joel all the way out of this text. I can promise you That's that. That's right. But, I mean, even right out of the gate. Now, we, when we look at what makes, you know, if I was asked the question tonight, so what, what is a church that makes God sick? How can we, as a church, make God sick? Well, number one, a change in ownership. Now, you know, every word of God is pure. And I mean, even the slightest tweaking of one word can change a whole man. And that's exactly what happens here. Now, there's one two-letter word that's changed here. When he addresses the Laodiceans, it says, under the angel, which is the pastor or the messenger of the church of the Laodiceans. Now, I want you to flip back to the beginning of chapter 3. I'm going to tell you something. And unto the angel of the church in Sardis. Now flip back to verse 14. And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans. He changed the word in to the word of. Now all the other churches, he said the church is in. He said the church in Smyrna. He said the church in Thyatira. The church in Philadelphia. But here, he says the church of the Laodiceans. He's not even claiming ownership of these people because they have taken ownership of the church that once belonged to the Lord. That's how disgusted he is with these people. I mean, it says in verse 20, he says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. Now, a lot of times we hear this passage used for salvation. You know, if the Lord is knocking on the door of your heart, you need to answer, you know. And it, and it can definitely 
be applied that way. But in the context, he's talking about the Lord standing outside the doors of his own church house and begging to be let back in. They have taken ownership of the church that the Lord Jesus Christ gave his life for. He died for the church. And I, look, when I say church, I'm not talking about a church building. Look, now we, we worship in this church house. But this right here in these pews, that's the church. And look, we can have church out there in the graveyard and still lock him out. You understand what I'm saying? There's a change in ownership and it makes God sick. He, he died for it. He paid for it. And somebody else is going to take over and make all the decisions like he didn't die for it. So a, a change in ownership makes him sick. And this is really fitting because the word Laodicea means the rights of the people. Did you know that? Laodicea means the rights of the people. Now what is worshiping God, what is serving God, what is obeying God have to do with all rights? Absolutely nothing. In fact, servants have no rights. Slaves have no rights. And that's what we are. If we're saved, we are servants God. It's not about our rights. Servants don't have any rights. But somehow this Laodicean church era has made it all about what we want and nothing about what he wants. And it, look, you don't have to drive very far down the road to find that out. I mean, you just read these church signs, you'll find out where we're at. I mean, I, it, it just blows my mind. I wish I had. You know, I, I drive all over West Alabama for my job, and I, I wish I have recorded some of the things I've seen. I mean, it's just amazing. Uh, there's a church right there on the Mississippi line, Back, Baptist Church. And their, their church motto is follow your heart. Follow your heart. You know, Jeremiah said the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I don't, I don't want to follow my heart. You don't need to follow your heart. But once again, it goes back to the rights of the people. Follow your we see so many examples of this change in ownership in our world today. I mean, we see it in the music in churches. I mean, I know that I sound like a legalist and I've got my hands stuck, stuck in sand. I'm not trying to upset you. I'm not trying to make anybody angry. I'm not trying to pick a fight. I'm just telling the truth. But the Bible says that we're to worship Him in spirit and in truth. It also says to abstain from all appearance of evil. So how in the world are we going to take something like rock and roll or rap that really it personifies the drug and sex culture in America and somehow take that and worship a holy God with it? You can't do it, friends. Right. Christian rock, Christian rap, that's an oxymoron. That's like saying Christian cocaine, Christian dope. I mean, that's about how much sense that makes. We can't do it. And, you know, people get upset about that. They get angry about that. And they say, well, look, we can worship God our way. You've got your way of worshiping God. i got my way of worshiping God. It's almost like a calendar. We're going to make 21. I mean, it's like Baskin Robbins, you know, 21 flavors of Jesus. What flavor of Jesus do you like? Let me ask you this. What does worship have to do with what we want? Hold on now. Who, who are we worshiping? We're worshiping a holy God. And we're going to be true worshipers. We've got to worship in the way that he wants us to worship him. And that's in spirit and truth. It has nothing to do with our preference. has nothing to do with what we want. It's all about what he wants. Good. If we're worshiping him, we've got to do it his way. Right. And we're, look, I remember probably one of the biggest arguments I ever got in high school was, that it was my senior year. And I, I went to Tuscaloosa Christian School. It was a good school. It had its problems. But, but I liked it. But... Uh, there was one particular church where a, a lot of the people, a lot of the students from that school came from that church. And they had an issue in that church where the pastor was going to local bars and he was playing rock and roll music. I'm talking about Led Zeppelin, I'm talking about Black Sabbath, I'm talking about stuff like that. He was playing rock and roll in the bars. And then he would come in church and play his brand of Christian music and his reasoning for that was, hey, I can, I can do that to win the lost. I can get them comfortable, and I can get them in church. But the older folks in church, they don't have that. 
they kick you to the curb. And I say, glory, hallelujah, amen. amen. And some of the people that was behind him and supporting that was talking about what a wonderful thing he's doing in those old, you know, those just old timers, those old fashioned legalist Pharisees, dinosaurs. They kicked him out. I can't believe they did that. And I said, well, I'm glad they did. And, and all, they wanted to argue me. I said, look, I ain't going to argue. I'm just going to tell you one thing. I don't believe in using the world to save the world. Right. Jesus didn't need it, and he still don't need it. Right. Look, we're not going to save the lost and dying world by feeding them the same garbage that they've always been eating. They've got to want something different. We see it in music. I mean, it's everywhere. And, and they always have to always have to make a big deal out of it. They give it a special name or something. There's a, there's a church out there on the outskirts of town. They got a, they just they just went to a contemporary music service. And it caused a split right down the middle. That's a nice sound of God right there. And I actually served with some of the people who went to that church and said a young guy took it over and he just basically kicked all the old timers out, took over and did did the things his way. Half the church left. And you go by the sign, come for our new contemporary worship service. They call it the power of it. Come get your power of it. How about come hear the word of God? Amen. How about come, come hear what thus saith the Lord? It's not, it's not about us. We're not coming here for a rock concert. We're coming here to worship the Lord in spirit and truth. We're coming to hear the word of God. Amen. We see it in music. We see it in ministers. I mean, it's everywhere. I mean, it's everywhere. I look, I can tell you a lay I see in church, most of the time by who the pastor is. If, if, if they got a woman pastor, it's a lay I see in church. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desire a good work, and he must be the husband of one wife. Does anybody have any trouble understanding that? See, my, not, I know that's not popular, but that's what he said. That's what we have to go by. And if he said, if a woman desire the office of bishop, she desire good work, she must be the wife of one husband, I'd sit down and I'd give her the coat. That's just what he said. But it's everywhere. And I, I mean, I'm a legalist bigot. I mean, my goodness. If, if, if Brother Scott, if uh, Brother Joe, y'all post this on the internet, I'm liable to have death threats on me. I'm not, I mean, Sorry. but that, that's where we're at. We are in Laodicea. And so when we stand up for the word of God, we're going to be the weirdos. Right. We're going to be the ones out of touch. Right. Yep. But that's what the Bible said. We see it in ministry. You know, we've got churches now that are ordaining homosexuals to stand behind the sacred death. It's everywhere. I think Brother Gary was telling me the Nazarene speaks to me here to just a little bit. They're going to vote on it. I don't care if they vote it down or not. Back there, even talking about it in sex me. The Episcopalians already done it. Everybody else is going to follow suit. The Methodists are doing it now. Where are we at, friends? I'm talking about abomination in the eyes of God. Okay. We see it in the ministers. We see it in the messages. Yep. I mean, my goodness. I mean, I get upset. I don't know why. I act like it's something new, but it just happens all the time. I'll be flipping, you know, our CD player in our car went out about two months ago. And so we got rhythm business. We we got a DVD player right here. So we put our CDs in the DVD player and it plays through the speakers, you know. Well, this went out the other day. So, and, you know, every every day I turn on the radio and flip like I'm going to find something good. It ain't going to happen. <laughs> it's not going to happen. And I thought to myself this morning, even as I was coming to church this morning, I said, you know, we're in the buckle of the Bible Belt. And it is Sunday morning. It is God's day. Surely to goodness. There will be an old leather lung preacher that's let her rip this morning. So I can't. It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. You can't find it. And I, I just don't understand it. Why would you want to listen to somebody that just filled you full of sunshine and sugar all the time? No, it ain't true. I mean, no, it ain't true. I know I'm not in good shape. But I, Lord, I'd be in bad shape, worse shape. I, I want somebody to tell me the truth. If I, if I had. Black-threaded cancer, and I went to the doctor. 
church of the Laodiceans write for him. These things say it, the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. Now, it says he's the faithful and he's the true witness. Now, if, if, if you're being charged with something, if you're guilty of a crime, and they, they sit you down in that courtroom, and they put a witness on the witness stand that knows you're guilty of sin. They got proof of it. And you know they're fixing to tell the truth. They're fixing to let it rip. And they're not going to sugarcoat it. You're, you're going to be sick. You know you're in trouble. He's the faithful, true witness. He knows everything about our life, even the secret things. And he's going to tell us like it is. Should we be willing to listen? Should we be willing to hear? Uh, we see it in the music, the ministers, the messages. We see it in these Bible verses, you know. I mean, I, I know that's a, another hot topic, and I just, man, I, I just don't, I don't argue no more. I, I just tell people. I mean, you, you can take it or leave it. But I mean, why would you want to destroy the Word of God? You're not, look, if you're, you're criticizing the Bible, you're not building anything. You're just destroying stuff. And I got news for you. You know, people want to argue facts, and they want to argue manuscripts, and they want to argue this, that, and something else. What, what are happened to those letters? Can you, it's like I said before, can you prove the virgin birth? I know it happened. Can you prove the resurrection of Jesus Christ? I know it happened. Do you really believe that the God that, you know, spoke the universe into existence in six days can really keep his word? Amen. He wants us to have it, and he's able to give it to us. What's so hard to understand about that? So it's like Brother Joey said, there's over 200 versions now, and there's another one that comes out every six months. Is God's work really changing that much? Is he really that incapable of giving us his work? We had a chaplain at Cook's, and he's a good guy, man. I don't, I don't mean to cut it down. He preaches Jesus, and I, I praise God for that. But he preached a little sermon that Friday at our monthly meeting. And I'm just being honest with you. If, if he had not told me that he was reading out of a Bible or what he calls Bible, but he had not told me he was coming out of 1 Corinthians, I wouldn't even know it was a Bible. I mean, it was, it was so worded in the language we speak today that it almost sounded like he was just reading a simple book book. And there's no power behind that. I mean, there, there's no power in that whatsoever. And, uh, man, there's power behind this book. Look, this way this book's got some weight to it. Amen. I mean, it's got some authority behind it. Amen. And you'd be hard-bred to go anywhere in the English-speaking world and find somebody that didn't recognize that book since they heard it. That's right. You know why? That book's got authority. I don't want to water it down to sound like the way I talk. I want what thus says the Lord. He wants us to have his word, and he's able to give it to us. This is that simple. We just need to get behind it. People don't, don't like the source, they want to change the source. I, I told you a few months back, I was approached by some Jehovah's Witnesses, and they were trying to tell me that Jesus isn't God. And I quoted John 1, 1 through 5 to him. And then I quoted some more scripture to him. And I quoted some more scripture. They said, oh, that's just, that, that's just that old King James Bible. That's, a, that's just old. That's, that's old hat. We found some new manuscripts. And it's, you just don't like the source. That's your problem. You know, instead of, instead of letting the Word of God change us, we want to change the Word of God. The reason people don't like this book and criticize it is because it's too much like God. We see it in our change of ownership. It's not our church. It's His church. We see it in the change of ownership. We also see it in a complacent attitude. Look at verse 15. I know thy works that are neither hot nor cold. I would that thou were cold or hot, so that because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. You make me sick. You make me want to vomit. That's what God said. Yep. Well, what, what made it that way? Well, the fact that we get lukewarm. And if you think about, think about this in the context of room temperature. Now, I, I try to be sensitive to what I see y'all doing. I mean, if I see people doing this, I try to turn it down. If I see people doing this, most of them don't freeze because I'm not naked. But anyway, 
But you either, you're either too hot or you're too cold. But if you ever get to that lukewarm place, you know what it means? It means you're comfortable and there's no need for any change. That's what this means. That's what lukewarm means. It means you're comfortable right where you're at and you don't need to change at all. That's what it means to be lukewarm. That's, that's a complacent attitude. It makes God sick. You know, how can we be complacent about the God of this universe, the one true living God that sent his only begotten Son to die for us, take our place on the cross, rise three days later, and call us into salvation? How can we get complacent about that? When there's people dying and going to hell every second, how can we get complacent about that? It's scary to me. And I'd actually, I had marked out a paragraph in the book to read. You know, knowing me, I forget everything. It's in the back room, but I'll just give you the rundown of it. I was reading John Phillips' commentary, and he was talking about just how crazy it is for us to be complacent about Jesus Christ. And he said, imagine if you went to the doctor, and he checked you out real good. And, you know, after he got through checking you out, and he just kind of kicked back and opened up a magazine and started reading. And he said, well, well Doc, did you find anything? Oh, yeah, but it's no big deal. Well, what did you find? Well, you got the bubonic plague. Well, the, the, the what? The, the bubonic plague. Isn't that life-threatening? Isn't that dead? Isn't yeah, but everybody dies. Well, yeah, I mean, isn't it contagious? Couldn't I give it to my family, my friends? Well, well yeah, well, they got to die sometimes, too. I mean, wouldn't that be crazy to be complacent about something so serious? And yet we do it about Jesus Christ all the time. And I'm telling you, we better be careful because there's a little bit of loud sea in every one of us. Sure. I mean, we better be careful because there's a little bit Allow to see in every one of us. And as crazy as that sounds about that illustration with the doctor, it's even crazier to be complacent about Jesus Christ. What he's done for us. I mean, he's in, he's in, you know, we're indebted because of what he's done for us. We're indebted with the gospel that he's given us and taken to a lost and dying world. And, you know, we, we get excited about all these temporary things that, that have no eternal weight, no eternal value. I mean, we get excited about football games, don't we? Yeah. I mean, look. Y'all don't sit there with your arms folded when Alabama scores a touchdown. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I get fun out of my arms sometimes. <laughs> I mean, I'm just, let's just be honest. I mean, I can back. Well, I think one of the funniest things I've ever seen Brother Ronnie do. <laughs> he, we, we took the youth over there at our house for the SEC championship game. A game was back and forth, back and forth. Well, Ken's oldest boy, Balin, was there. He's about, what, nine, eight or nine. And he just likes to be contrary. He's really not into football at all. He just likes to make people mad. And, and every time Georgia would score or do something, yeah, Georgia, woo! And I, I tell you, look, I have, an, I have some commandments that go above the Ten Commandments, and that's just one of those absolute, you do not cheer for another team in my house. <laughs> and, and I was, I was, I was really starting to boil over that thing. And I mean, I know it's unspiritual. I'm just being honest with you. And, and I'm thinking to myself, Brandon, you better get a hold of yourself because if you fly the handle, Brother Ryan fly the fire you. And by that time, by the time I'd had enough, Georgia blocks a field goal, runs it back for a touchdown, and it feels like the game's out of reach. And I'm just about to die. And he's just going crazy in my living room. And I'm just about, I'm just about to reach out and say something and strangle him. And before I got to it, Brother Ronnie beat me to the punch. <laughs> he says, he said, Ben, who's Georgia's coach? I don't know. Name one player on their team. I don't know. Well, then be quiet. You don't know nothing about football. <laughs> and I just sat there all, you know, acting all spiritual. Like, I can't believe you just did that. But I'm telling you, we get excited about things that don't even matter, you know? Hey, that, that football, God, that museum and all the trophies going to melt to the elements. 
like you see her. God, I want to see myself through your eyes. What do I need to change? Be careful. He'll do it. But he'll change your life. Change your life for the better. Corrupt vision. Let me say that vision is a vital part of the church. Without it, we have nothing. Uh, Proverbs 2019 says, where there is no vision, the people perish. It's vital. So what's the solution? How can we avoid becoming a lukewarm church? How can we avoid as individuals being lukewarm Christians? Well, here's the solution. Verse 19. He says, Me, as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Boy, there's the best word. It'll change everybody. Repent. Jesus said, Except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. He said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sow with him and he with me. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and have sat down with my father in his throne. He that hath to hear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Now, let me say this in closing. Verse 20 to verse 22, this is the last place in all of the Bible before the rapture of the church. Chapter 4 and verse 1, we're gone. We're, we're raptured out. We're raptured out of here. For those that have heard the gospel, you have no more chances. It's all over. And so this is the last word, essentially, our chances are gone. The last invitation, so to speak. And I, I like what he said here. He said, Behold, I stand through not in any man. I mean, this church is in such bad shape. He didn't say if the deacons. He didn't say if the pastor, the Sunday school teacher. He said if any man will open them. That, that's a personal challenge tonight. Amen. Will you open them to him tonight? Will you open the door of your heart and say, God, perhaps maybe you've never been saved. You say, God, I need you for salvation. I give you my life. I repent of my sins. Maybe tonight you need to open the door and get in some things that you've been holding on to. Maybe tonight you need to open the door and get rid of some attitudes. Maybe you need to get rid of some pride. But I'm telling you, rev revival starts with one person, if any man. And a lukewarm church can sometimes be turned around by one person. Just, just gets tired of it. Hey, I'm tired of all the fakeness. I'm tired of all the facades. I'm tired of being superficial. And I'll go open the door for them. Jesus, I want you in here. If you want to have a life and a church that pleases God. That's the first place to start. Lord, forgive me. I repent. I'll open the door to you. Nobody else will open it for me. That's the personal choice we have to make individually. Right? What's your choice tonight? What do you need to open up the door and give to the Lord tonight? Would you stand?